we've got you fresh off um, the leadership campaign. What was your? Do you want to explain what your your role was on the on the Becky Long Bailey campaign? So I was brought in uh, early January to head up communications. So um, in my team was obviously we did press, uh, digital communications, we did events. Events fell under my team as well. Um, and really, I was involved from the what was the early stages of the campaign, uh, building up the, the campaign team, and you know working on messaging, working on uh, interventions, strategic interventions that were made throughout the campaign. So yes, um, it's been a very very long campaign. Obviously, it's been a long three months, uh, very intense and very very unique and unusual circumstances. I would say, particularly for the left, I don't think we've been in this position before where we've just lost very badly um, in a general election and having to deal with the consequences of that for the, you know, in terms of the political context and where we go from there. And it's been a learning curve, I think, from, from my perspective. Uh, I think we made some mistakes in how we read the Labour membership. I mean, these are the things that I've learned in the campaign um, and I think it's really important that the left learns the right lessons. And I think that Jeremy Corbyn won in 2015 because he was the only anti-austerity candidate. And because he was the only anti-austerity candidate, he was able to unite the soft left and the hard left and the paper members. And the paper members, they want to win an election. They're broadly left wing. They're anti-austerity. You know, they're social, de social democrats. Um, and he was, Jeremy Corbyn, was the only person standing up for social democracy in that 2015 leadership contest. And then I think this time around, uh, the soft left and the paper members, they, they sort of grew, obviously, uh, disaffected and disillusioned with the, the left, with Corbynism as a project. Corbynism, from their perspective, ended on the 13th of December. And that project ended, and it was time for something new from that from that, from then on. And I just want to just read out a couple of things, like, but I think illustrate this very well. So, this is from YouGov polling in December of Labour members. So, forty-four percent of Labour members think thought that Labour should be more centrist. Thirty-two percent had no preference. Fourteen percent don't know. But this was a crucial one. Do you think Corbynism or Jeremy Corbyn's leadership changed the party for the better? Only twelve percent said yes, change the party for the worse, 56%. So the reason I'm telling you this is because I think it's really important that the, the people have recognized that this wasn't a case of just uh, Jeremy Corbyn handing the baton to the next leader, uh, the next person that he, he wanted to succeed in. We just lost a general election. And I think that the campaign really was, it was difficult to mobilize people because we were trying to appeal to the soft left and we had to appeal to the soft left because, as I just illustrated with that polling, we'd lost them quite badly. Jeremy Corbyn's coalition had splintered and fractured. Uh, so I think by focusing the campaign on trying to appeal to the soft left, we didn't mo mobilise enough people. So that's my kind of analysis is, you know, Jeremy Corbyn mobilised a lot of people. People knew what his politics were. He'd been around for decades. It, they knew what he stood for. And, it, and he was able to bring that coalition together. And I think it was very difficult for, in the current context, to do the same thing. That, I just want to focus on that polling, first of all, because I hadn't, it, was that a private poll? No, that, I, hadn't, I hadn't seen that before. That was in the public YouGov polling, yeah. So and, but, but seriously, only 12% of people thought that Corbyn and Corbynism made the Labour Party better who were yeah. Labour members. Yes, exactly. So that was what well, we did. And then we were like, oh, that's really, that's really that's very damning in fact well exactly and this is, this is the thing um and you know i don't necessarily agree with that but this is how people were feeling after the election people were going through a grieving process and people were thinking i don't want that to ever happen again i don't want to ever lose an election again of course you will lose ele elections general elections but people were feeling in that moment uh you know that they wanted to grasp for for something that seemed to make sense in in, in the context of trying to win an election and look, Keir Starmer, um, I think the campaign succeed, our campaign succeeded in making sure that he made commitments, those 10 commitments on policy that we can now hold him to. And I think that, you know, on a policy level, he was, 
I think he, I think he uh, appealed to most members. Most Labour members are probably in that kind of ballpark on a policy level. Um, I thought they run a very good campaign. I uh, spoke to Simon Fletcher after, uh, congratulated them on the campaign, obviously, and Ben Nunn, which has been made Director of Communications. You know, they're going to do, the, you know, I wish them all the best. You know, the last thing they need is people sniping at them. Um, but I, I think that in that moment uh, after the election, I think, I think we underestimated as a movement how many people in the Labour Party, how many Labour members were ideological socialists. I think we overestimated how many were ide ideological socialists. Um, and I think we, after 2017, we overestimated in the country the appeal of democratic socialism. Um, and I think that where we were in 2017 was probably about where the country was. And I felt like in 2019, we perhaps uh, had an offer, had a manifesto that was a bit like if we'd been in government for two years. So, I mean, here going back a little bit on those things, it probably resonates with, with the members um, not going as far as 2019. Uh, I think that's probably where most of the members are. So what I'm saying is, look, we've got a leader now we can work with. Uh, I think, you know, there will be opportunity to, to influence and there will be an opportunity to scrutinise on a policy level. And I think that the right of the party is going to marginalise itself. It's going to keep throwing stones and keep briefing the press and negatively and uh, undermining the whole project. And, and whereas on the left, I think it's so important that we just respect the outcome of the vote. Keir won. Uh, we, we respect votes. We, we respect the legitimacy of his leadership work with him work and build, rebuild those alliances with the soft left. Because I think that is so important now is that we don't let the Blairites back in. Matt, does it, does it sort of, I mean, for me, I, I hear all of that and I, I agree with pretty much all of it, but do you not think there's a kind of basic, there was a basic failure with the campaign, which perhaps you've already highlighted about the need to reach out to the soft left, which was that it just wasn't exciting. Uh, Keir Starmer was never going to make it an exciting campaign. Rebecca Long Bailey failed to make it an exciting campaign. And actually something quite dull and predictable always suited him, always played to his strengths. And I do wonder, I, I, I completely understand, I think Rebecca Long Bailey was, was never going to, and I would agree with that, that conclusion. And I think that the idea if she, if she pitched herself as a continuity Corbyn candidate, she, she wouldn't have won either. But for me, it was, well, wh why should she be any more continuity Corbyn than Keir Starmer? Keir Starmer had a more senior role. She's younger. She's a woman. Uh, she's got great green credentials. You could have had a very shiny, happy, high energy launch, lots of young people, green politics, new economy, excitement. And people wouldn't even be talking about Jeremy Corbyn. And so I wonder if I agree with you, if you run as a continuity Corbyn candidate, that's precisely what's going to happen. But in the absence of offering something new and exciting, your opponents did that anyway. Do you, do you think that was something of an issue? She didn't really hit the ground running. There wasn't that energy. And if so, why was that? Well, first of all, uh, continuity Corbyn wasn't something that we, wasn't like a message that we had crafted. It was a label that was uh, attributed to her, uh, which I thought was very unfair from the start. Um, and it was something that we, we did our best to push back on. Uh, but I think there, in terms of the launch, the actual official launch of the campaign, I thought that was actually probably one of the, the better moments of the campaign. Mm -hmm. I thought it was, it was high energy. It was a lot of young people. It looked slick. It was well put together. She did a series of very, very good broadcast clips. She did very good sit-down interviews. From on a comms level, on a polit political level, um, I thought it was very, very effective. And actually, it reset the campaign because it did, as you said, it did get off to a slower start because obviously she had not been planning a leadership run. She was still thinking about it over Christmas. Um, it's a massive undertaking and a massive commitment. And, you know, I, I don't blame anyone for thinking very carefully about whether they want to do it. But Keir Starmer was obviously planning his campaign uh, quite a lot in advance of the general election. And that showed and he was, he was able to get off to a, a flying start launched a very, very good video that addressed a lot of the concerns that the members might have had with him. Um, and, he, and look, I mean, I think we did everything we could in announcing things that were radical and exciting, open selections, BBC reform. Uh, we announced like, party democracy reforms. We announced uh, things that we were going to do in the party to try and win an election, like cha change the 
the whole approach to communications and how the party relates to people and members and communities, um, reset the relationship with the trade union movement. Like there were lots of things that were good and quite and like radical, um, but you can only announce them, make sure they get good showing in the press and in broadcast. Um, but if they don't cut through to people, which is going the next level, that suggests that there just isn't the enthusiasm for the contest. And I, I think that's what we suffered from, is there wasn't people willing to engage. People were just feeling really defeated. They were feeling deflated by the whole thing. I just want to, so two, two things, just in as a, 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 as an a, appendage to what you just said, Matt. So there was, from the sounds of it, and this is what I've heard elsewhere, there was no succession planning from the leader's office uh, in terms of what happens next after the December result. No, there was no, there was no, no succession no. planning. No, no. So, you, so you would say that was one of the major reasons why Keir Starmer came out of the blocks, you know, yeah. neutralized the criticisms in a way that Rebecca Lombardi. So already she was starting from a difficult position because of yes. Labour losing, and then yeah. that absence of a succession plan kind of sealed the deal. Yes. The fact that people thought we might have a chance at some at one stage of you know catching up was a real testament to 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 her and to the team because we we really we in the in the early stages there was nothing and we you know we got everything up and running and it looked like a decent campaign and we were making mm. good. Well, the launch was great, yeah, I remember. Um, and and you know I thought she did a series of very very good interviews where she came across very well. Uh, I thought she. I think she's very capable. I think she's very diligent. She's across the detail. I think she's good, a uh, good candidate, very good person to work with. Um, but Keir was way ahead, and he was way ahead because he had the infrastructure in place, and he had the people in place, and he had the money. And that was what we were trying to nail him, nail him on. We were saying, you know, surely that candidates should have to disclose who their donors are. Now, so and not only was there not a succession plan. The rules of the game weren't exactly in our favour as well. Like, if like we were we were accused in the beginning of being like in with the bureaucracy of the party and all this kind of stuff, and like, oh, you're the kind of chosen campaign and all this stuff, like, which is was complete nonsense. Because if that was true, then they would have said that all candidates have to declare their donors up front, mm. and then that would have been uh, actually quite helpful. <laughs> because well, not just helpful to us, you know, on a cynical level, but also fair i think and you know members have a right to know that stuff i think i think that 12 percent was the general public i've just looked it up just it doesn't sound it's the the, the link i'm on it say i think it's the general public to only 12 percent think he changed the party for the better and 56 labor, labor members is 27 percent. labor members is okay so that's still not great and um change, yeah. the, change the party for the worst 36 percent of, of um, that's Labour members who think it was changed the party for the worst. Yes. Okay. So even and, even among Labour members, they're not particularly and, enamoured with Corbynism. At this and point the, in time. the should be more centrist is forty four percent public, thirty three percent, forty three percent Labour members. So there's very little difference there. You see, I, I, yeah. I you know, it's, a, it's such a broad category. You know, I'd, I, I like the idea of Labour being more rhetorically centrist. I like the idea of Labour wearing nice suits and going, you know, we we just want to just calm things down, you know, reset the economy and not. The idea of you know maybe being rhetorically radical isn't a thing, you know. I, I think that was one of the successes of the 2017, like you said, the manifesto. Yeah. It just it just tapped into a common sense, and people went, "Yeah, why don't we do that already?" Uh, is that centrism? Yeah. You know, I don't know. Yeah, no, exactly. I think I think that the there's a difference between being um, centrist on a kind of ideological level on the spectrum of like okay, so what is that social economic liberalism, and mm -hmm. where the public centre of gravity is. Mm. I mean, most people would say I'm a centrist because they they see themselves mm. as the uh, arbiter of common sense, and that is sort of the, the proxy, right? So, um, yeah, it's it's things that are radical but seem reasonable to the public and yeah. radical given where we are. So, like, yeah, not taxing corporations the level that they were taxed in 2011 isn't radical. Um, it's pretty reasonable and reasonable to most people, but given where we were it was kind of quite a radical shift. It was like increasing it by a substantial amount. Mm. Um, equally, free tuition fees isn't particularly radical. It's the case across Europe. And this was some of the things, one of the things Becky was trying to say in the campaign is that we need to articulate what we stand for and we need to articulate our, our vision for the country um, in terms that don't frighten people, in terms that do appeal to people's sense of like what is, what's to be expected. 
What do you think is is next for the Labour left then? Because I mean, I, f- I think some of those those conclusions you you've come out with they're quite they're quite strong. It feels like you know why you think Rebecca Long Bailey sort of lost the campaign, which is that actually, and I mean, this is something we've talked about on the show in terms of Bernie Sanders also not winning the Democratic primary, an excellent candidate, is that maybe um, well the the public, let alone the members, aren't as as far left as as you know people people like us on Navarra Media might have hoped they were. Um, so if if that is the the conclusion you've come to. What role do you think the Labour left do play in the Labour Party now? How, how do you see the left organising? What role do they have? Um, how do you think a momentum, for example, should relate to, to a leader like Keir Starmer? Well, I think the left has to uh, support the leadership. It has to, um, doesn't mean that uncritically, doesn't mean uncritically support it, come what may, uh, on everything it does, but support uh, trying to uh, attain a Labour government and not be wreckers and uh, contribute constructively, be as constructive as possible and contribute ideas. And I think those ideas, you know, for example, Jonathan Reynolds is, is going to be the uh, shadow DWP secretary. He's in favour of universal basic income. Like, the, like the, the, I think they're going to be receptive to radical ideas. I think this is very, very different to Ed Miliband. Ed Miliband, he still had the Blairites kicking about and he had to accommodate them. And I don't feel like Keir has felt like he's had to accommodate them to the extent that Ed Miliband had to. I don't think he wanted to. So I think it's a very, very different story now. And we are, we are still influential in this context. But if we marginalise ourselves, we won't be. So I think we have to contribute constructively and be as constructive as possible. And re, as I say, rebuild that alliance with the soft left. Was that, a, was that a conscious reason why Rebecca Long-Bailey was so rarely sort of even, let alone attacked, she barely criticised Keir Starmer? So one of the things I, I thought in terms of that would have made her victory more likely would have been, for example, if, say, she she jumped on Keir Starmer when in the morning he said he wouldn't speak to the Sun during a Labour leadership election and then in the afternoon um, said he would do after a Labour leadership yeah. election. And, and I thought at the time Rebecca Long-Bailey should really be going, Keir Starmer is a flip-flopper. Um, over this but there is you know the, the alternative position I suppose is that if she already saw the writing on the wall and saw that Keir Starmer was going to lead this particular race then she didn't want to make an enemy of him given that she knew he was ultimately at some point um, well, going to be her boss and going to decide whether or not she'd be in the shadow cabinet and, and whether or not he would embrace the left or see them as as an enemy was that was that potentially why Rebecca Longbelly held her tongue I don't I don't think I don't think so I, I think it was more she was reluctant to do attack um, it, it, for many, many of the same reasons Jeremy was, which is that um, particularly attacking on her own side, she didn't feel comfortable doing that. She didn't feel comfortable um, attacking, yeah, other candidates. So I think that's fair enough in a leadership contest, particularly when you're seen as the continuity candidate of the bureaucracy in the, the leader's office, even if you know there was no succession plan, you're seen as that. Uh, to I think there was a feeling of like, we're going to put forward a positive vision. Um, we're not going to attack the other. I don't know. It just, it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel right at the hustings to do it. The hustings were not set up for that kind of antagonism. Um, it didn't feel right to do it in the press. Uh, and I felt like Keir was running a positive campaign and they did a good job of that. And if we're attacking him, it looks, it can look a bit desperate. I've got two questions for you, Matt. Uh, quickly, do you think aspirational socialism was a good good frame? That's the that's the first one. Um, and then, secondly, do you think that um, there was a failure generally with the campaign, in so much as very quickly, Lisa Nandy got to represent herself as the candidate for the non-London members, the non-metropolitan members, sort of in touch with working class. Labour supporters, voters, got an endorsement from the NUM, got an endorsement from the GMB. I saw that all happening and I just thought this should all be happening for Rebecca Long-Bailey. Maybe not the actual endorsement from the GMB, but it seemed to me that there was an attempt to frame Rebecca Long-Bailey as the kind of young millennial momentum candidate, which is great. You need that. Corbyn had those people. But at the same time, there wasn't an attempt to reach out to the other parts of his vote, which really matter. Mm. You've you've already said the soft left, but also older people who might be in leave voting seats uh, where, you know, 
the the CLP has just been through thick and thin together, uh, where there's a very different political economy, a very different political conversation to Manchester, to Brighton, to, to London. So those are two questions, the aspirational socialism one, and then the inability really to go beyond a younger metropolitan sort of uh, demographic. So first of all, the, the NUM is about 10 old blokes sitting in someone's front room. But it was symbolic, <laughs> wasn't it? I'm like, sorry? It was symbolic though, wasn't it? it well, was, okay, fine. But like, I wouldn't read too much into the NUM. And the GMB were not, you know, hugely supportive of uh, obviously the Green New Deal and that kind of um, green radicalism that Rebecca wanted to represent. So I think that that, you know, those things have to be taken into account. Mm. And I think that it was, it was actually pretty inevitable that Lisa would get the GMB nomination. Um, I would say as well, though, that Lisa was in a, uh, in a unique position in the race, particularly in the final three, because she wasn't having to, or feeling like she was having to defend the previous leadership. So she did have this kind of freedom, I think. It looked like a freedom to say what she wanted, and she looked like more like the straight-talking, honest politics candidate. Mm -hmm which is the, the space that Jeremy occupied in 2015. But if you are the establishment, if you are the bureaucracy, if you do represent what well, you have to be accountable for, the decisions that were taken by the leadership, um, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, we weren't outsiders, we weren't insurgents. We were running a very, very different campaign to Jeremy in 2015 and Jeremy in 2016, and we had to. And it was about the context, and I think that people have to bear that in mind. Like, Jeremy was the right person to lead the Labour Party in 2015, and he was the right person to lead the Labour Party in 2016. And Labour members, that's why they voted for it. Um, but I feel like the context changes, things move on. And he, I think Jeremy Corbyn was the person who had the best chance of winning that election in 2017 of all the candidates that stood in 2015, obviously more than Owen Smith. I think his brand of insurgent, anti-establishment politics nearly did the job in 2017 and, you know, I think, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think it was, it was very, come very, very close. Basically, in in twenty twenty, we're in a different we're in a different world now. We've lost a general election. Um, members are looking for something different, and I think we have to we have to recognise that we can't just keep running the same campaign again and again. We've got a, a couple of questions I want to I want to throw in from the audience. Spiritual Human asks: Was RLB campaign consciously or by consequence of just running, making sure Keir Starmer expressed socialist credentials, thereby pushing his campaign more left than it may have wanted? Um, and Darby PA asks: Will we ever get to know who funded Sir Starmer? Um, I might just jump in on that second one. Actually, I think in the in the next edition of Private Eye, uh, Solomon Hughes today tweeted that it's going to be it's going to become apparent that a major funder for Change UK was one of Keir Starmer's funders, but it won't be named until that edition of Private Eye comes out. Um, he's a journalist for Private Eye. Um, but Matt, I'll go to you for, well, that first question. And then if you've got any goss on the second one, was it, was it, a, was it a conscious decision or just by consequence of, of RLB standing that, that Keir Starmer was pushed to the left? And I suppose to what extent do you think he was pushed to the left? That's a very good question. I think um, by consequence, it wasn't conscious. Obviously, I think it's important that the left runs in leadership contests to be standard bearers for a particular type of politics, to you know stick big red flags in the ground and uh, start conversations and uh, affect the discourse on policy. I think it's very important. But I think what we were able to do is, I think, draw Keir out to much firmer commitments just by making those commitments ourselves and being in the contest. I think that that, is, that was a consequence. That wasn't the... That wasn't the reason that Rebecca ran. Obviously, Rebecca was in it to win it. But um, yes, I think I think I think the outcome was better than it better than it would have been if she didn't run. Uh, and in terms of so that's, so just to finish that point, I think it's really important now that as as a, an organised left, uh, we we hold the leadership to to those commitments. I think it's absolutely fair. It's absolutely fair enough to to hold the leadership to policy commitments and to scrutinise them and Keir on those commitments. I don't think that's wrecking. And I think that we have to draw the distinction between that uh, and what the, the Labour right does. And I think it's really important that they remain marginalised. And will we ever get to know who funded Keir Starmer? Well, look, I wanted to I wanted to do a direct mail shot like he did. Uh, it would have cost £300,000. So 
<laughs> which was pretty much all the money that we had. <laughs> so uh, someone was funding it or some people, individuals, entities were funding it. And I think, look, I wasn't, uh, I don't think we were, we were unfair asking, asking if they would disclose who those donors were for the, in the interest of transparency. We believe it on, it's, a, it's a principled issue for us, you know. I hope that those donors, whoever they are, don't exert a huge amount of influence over him. But you don't get something for nothing in life and in politics. So that was my worry is like, if he wins, is he going to owe all these people, you know, influence? And, and therefore, it's going to be more difficult to keep him left. I don't know how much influence you're going to get over Keir Starmer for 300 grand. I feel like that was you know, more than so many. There were just so many rich people who were fucking desperate to get rid of a Corbynite from the Labour Party because they wanted a, well, I mean, depending on how you look at it, uh, well, a, an opposition which conformed more to the type of what they expect from Westminster politicians, which you might look at as, as protecting the vested interests of the powerful. Um, or, I mean, you can you can frame it however you want. Um, Aaron, do you want to come in or should I go to a, a question from a, an audience member? You go in. Go on, ask one. Okay, so TH Wolf, this is a very good question. I think this is going to be actually the key question um, or one of the key questions for Keir Starmer going forward. Is the Labour Party under Keir Starmer able to bring the progressive younger voters along that will need to stand a chance at the next general election? Does he have that kind of appeal or instinct? Um, I have some thoughts on that, but I'm going to go to you first. Who wants to take that, Matt? Well, we'll go on, Matt. To the guest. Um... I think so. I think he. I think he can, uh, and I think that really it comes down to policy. And uh, I think if he can keep a lot of the policies that were in the 2019 manifesto that appealed to younger people, he's already talked in the campaign about abolishing tuition fees. Um, he's appointed Rebecca uh, as shadow education secretary, so I feel like that that's that commitment is safe. Um, Obviously, I think there's space to go much further, but we don't know what the world's going to be like in 2024. You spoke, obviously, at the beginning of the program before I come, came in about, like, how much economic upheaval and turmoil there's going to be as a result of the coronavirus. So, like, how we rebuild and what the economy looks like next month, let alone next year, it's difficult to say. And, obviously, the election's not till 2024. So, I think... I think he's going to have to be radical in his offer. And if he can combine radicalism with uh, credibility or the appearance of credibility uh, and inspire confidence in older voters, uh, then I think the policies will do the rest for, for younger voters. I think he's going to really struggle to keep a lot of younger voters. Uh, the reason being one of the, one of the, you know, one of his USPs, his big sort of selling point is respectability politics. And by doing the respectability politics stuff, you know, it, how authentic does it look if Keir Starmer's talking to, to Stormzy, you know, when he goes on to Lad Bible? Now, that doesn't win you elections. Jeremy Corbyn did all of that stuff, and I'm not suggesting it does win you elections. But the, the secret source is in keeping that coalition Jeremy Corbyn got, which was more than 10 million people last year in December, which was still a failure, but that was more than either Ed Miliband or Gordon Brown or Tony Blair in 2005. How do you keep that coalition together and then get an extra two, three million? And I think even just keeping that coalition together is quite hard, uh, especially if there's any sort of departure, if they leave behind a lot of left wing policies. We've already seen it with a Miliband between 2010, 2015. You know, the Green Party in 2015 got almost a million votes. Uh, I don't think that could be necessarily repeated because I think the behavior of the Green Party in the last several years has really exposed them for what they are. Uh, but it's it's got to be a concern. You know, young people aren't going to... Young people are ethnic, ethnic minorities, by the way. You know, there's, this is a front bench now. There's not a single... Uh, there's Lisa Nandy, who's mixed race, mixed heritage, has got a senior role. But other than her and David Lammy, there's no real... And then you've got uh, Marsha de Cordova. But Diane Abbott was uh, shadow foreign secretary. You know, you've got a lot of BAME people um, who aren't there anymore in senior roles. So... Why should Bain people vote Labour if they're not seeing representation of Bain people at the top levels of the party? Uh, Labour take these people for granted, uh, and I think they do so at their, um, you know, at their own peril. Uh, so I think he will struggle. But I think the solution there is the left needs to recompose itself and bloody quickly uh, through the socialist MPs in Parliament, 
through the left trade unions, Unite, CWU, FBU, Baker's Union, through Momentum, through, through uh, TWT. And what I think is actually in many ways, the most important takeaway here is that the next three months are more important than the last three months. That might sound crazy because you had a decent candidate with a decent chance of, you know, she, she came second. Uh, you have to bear in mind that until Jeremy Corbyn, radical left candidates came last or didn't run in Labour leadership contests. Uh, but the next three months matter more than the last three months because now it's about recomposing, re-solidifying those left forces. And I don't think Labour can win an election without them actually having the House in order. And also, I don't think Keir Starmer will have a concrete uh, centre-left policy proposal without them having their House in order. Because all the countervailing pressures, as we said yesterday, from the media, uh, from the parliamentary Labour Party, from the Tories, from big business, take it right. And unless you have a powerful, coherent left uh, to stop that, to mitigate it, and actually hopefully to drag it in the opposite direction, and at the same time building consent in public more broadly for that programme, I think Labour have big problems. So it's, it's in Keir Starmer's interest, I would argue, uh, perhaps a bit of a counterintuitive argument, it's in Keir Starmer's interest, if he wants to be the Prime Minister, for the left to organise itself, to mobilise itself quickly and effectively. I mean, I, I'd make, oh, well, unsurprisingly, I suppose, I'd make exactly the same the same argument. I mean, I do think that what's, why Keir Starmer's position is so interesting right now is that in on an institutional level, the left really don't have very much leverage at all because I think that Keir Starmer could quite easily demote all the all the lefties from from shadow cabinet. He can sack um, Jenny Formby. Um, no one in the media is going to care. They're just all going to clap. Um, most of the PLP will just clap. And it's not as if sort of Rebecca Long Bailey or anyone on the left is going to be given a chance to to wreck his chances because they won't get airwaves in the same way that that Wes Streeting um, or Jess Phillips did. Also, they're just numerically weaker in the parliamentary Labour Party than the than the right were. So whilst Keir Starmer, if he wanted to, I think could tomorrow basically purge the left from the Labour Party. The reason I hope he won't is because he has enough foresight to realise that the only way he's going to win a general election is by keeping the left on board for two reasons. One, because they're his only bolster and ballast against the right you know, taking him down as they took down Ed Miliband. Ed Miliband didn't have really anyone to the left of him. And that meant that he was completely in hock to to the people to the right of him. And it meant that we went into the 2015 general election with completely wishy-washy um, offer that just didn't inspire anyone. Um, at the same time, I think this, this does come down to this youth question. And I think the only way that the Labour Party is going to win at this point really is by looking like a coalition. Um, because, yeah, I, I'm not convinced that Keir Starmer himself as a person is going to be able to mobilise young voters. I think it's going to be perfectly acceptable to young voters. I don't think he's going to switch them off. But he does need a dynamic, pluralist youth wing of the Labour Party um, to be making sure that people turn out at the next general election because you know you you cannot take young voters for granted. That's something that we you know the last five years of electoral history have have proven beyond doubt. We can't take young voters for granted, of course not. But I mean. Uh, I, I do think that uh, the real problem Labour has is with older voters. I think that is the big, big problem. They didn't want to vote for Jeremy Corbyn. Um, we do have to find a way. In 2017, a lot of them stayed at home. A lot of them, because of the dementia tax, they didn't bother. We've got to find a way of trying to win back some of those older voters. And I just feel like, yes, OK, we can keep the younger people. Hopefully we can with the policies that hopefully Keir is going to stick to. And I do think that we can, as you said, we, we can ensure that uh, we put pressure on the leader to, to, to make sure that he sticks to those commitments. But I also think that he knows that when the right come for him, it's only going to be the left that defends him. And he'd be mad to alienate the left uh, at any stage, because I think it's true. I think if the right come for him, the left would defend him. Um, and I think, as I say, it all comes back to the alliance between the soft left and the left. If we can build that, maintain that, then we'll be in a much, much better position as a movement. 